Welcome to Pedo Teeth Talk, brought to you by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, a podcast show that delivers cutting-edge ideas for the professionals specializing in pediatric dentistry. Welcome to Pedo Teeth Talk, where we're here to talk about contemporary issues important to you in your practice of pediatric dentistry. We care about the dentistry for children improving all the time, and we're thrilled to be here today at the annual session of the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry in Honolulu, Hawaii. And we're not that disappointed that we're inside in the exhibit hall at the Tech Bar, not seeing the sun and the waves, because we have the world's experts on various topics. And I'm Joel Berg, host today of Pedo Teeth Talk, and I'm thrilled to have with me today Dr. Nestor Kohenka of Seattle, Washington, with whom I've had the pleasure of working for many years. One of the great endodontists. If you need a root canal and you're in Seattle, call this guy. Okay? And, uh, and anything related to the pulp. Uh, Dr. Kohenka also happens to be the president of the IADT, the International Association of Dental Traumatology. And as you know, the APD has adopted their guidelines. And uh, Nestor, welcome. Thank you Thank for you. being here today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, I want to start. I want to talk about a few things today. We're going to talk about traumatology. We're going to talk about the association. If we have time, and I will make times, I want to talk about vital pulp therapy. That would be great. Because you're, you spoke about that today, and there's so much to talk about there. So I'm going to try to cover a lot in the next half hour or less. So first, let's talk about this meeting. Um, I want to put it in a plug because all of us can go to the World Congress of Dental Traumatology. It's on August 15th or 18th in San Diego. That is correct. Maybe tell me a little bit about the meeting. Well, the meeting is going to be uh, the first time that the IDT has been actually joining forces with a U.S. large organization like the AAE in this case. So the end actually, of the association, okay. <clears throat> correct. And actually, the idea was actually born from the APD AAE. Oh, if yes. you remember the summit meeting, in the Phoenix, summit think, in, was in Scottsdale, correct? Scottsdale, 2012. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. So actually, that's kind of where it you know, grew up from, and, and we developed a very large program. The World Congress is being held every two years, somewhere in the world. The last two, just to give an example, were in Turkey and Brisbane, Australia. And this time, as Percy and I brought the Congress here to the U.S., and proudly to basically have the support of the AE and the APD in many regards. And hopefully this is going to be the largest and, and most well-attended lecture or meeting, sorry, World Conference in dental trauma in the world. I think it's fantastic the fact that, you know, the APD now recognizes the expertise that, and, and the work that went into creating these trauma guidelines, and that they have just said, let's go to the experts. They said That's this. True. We adopt those guidelines. So maybe you could just talk about how these guidelines were developed. Tell me a little bit about the process and what kind of work went into creating these trauma guidelines. So traditionally, the guidelines were created and developed by the IDT board of directors. Basically, that was the way it was <clears throat> till 2016 were created. And they were discussed every two years, of course, whether or not there's new research, you know, supporting either a change or, or no of the, of, the, of the guidelines available at the moment. In 2013, I believe, is actually when you were president of the APD, is that where we got that connection in which the AE has been already endorsing our guidelines for probably 15, 20 years, and the only disconnection was the APD because they were not only recommending some minor different approaches, but also even they were classifying the injuries in a different way using an Ellis classification, for example, which I is see. confusing. Yeah, we don't and, talk about that anymore, right? right. That's, that's gone. No more Ellis classification. Right. Got right. it. So yeah. basically we want to name and term Take everything <laughs> with the same term. I mean, we need yeah. to speak the same language, right? and we need to call the injuries the same way, and we need to... Tr- you know, treatment plan and diagnose in the same way. So we need that understanding. So that's when the APD kind of merge and join forces. So right now is the IDT doing all the research and work and then the AE and APD basically reviewing and endorsing hopefully in the future as well. 2017, when I took over, I decided to change the protocol of how it's being developed. So instead of the having the board, changed correct, bit, okay? dramatically actually, not a bit. Basically, I appointed a committee that is in charge of reviewing the evidence-based in trauma uh, that is being published con- constantly, I mean, all the time. So, and then basically it's, it's combined by all, I mean, eight people from different specialties, different parts of the world, different background, mostly scholar researchers, clinicians, and they are in charge of basically providing a report to the board whether, you know, before it was just the board discussing this. So right now we're gonna have a, a very well a evidence-based paper recommendation by this committee 
that will be discussed at the board meeting and hopefully approved for, for the new publications. So I can tell you that during the last year, we've been working in the new guidelines that are going to hopefully be approved in August and will be hopefully released you know, a few months later. And there are quite a bit of changes in the new guidelines because I'm part of that committee, so I can tell you that there are a lot of changes coming so up. Can we get a sneak preview today? Sure. Get a sure. scoop here? What kind of changes are we going to see in these new guidelines? I want to know a few. Well, I want, to, I want, <coughs> I want Pedo Teeth Talk to be the, the scooping place for these well, new trauma def- guidelines. Def- definitely it's going to be it. the first time yeah, I'm talking hear, about this oh, openly. First time right here. You heard it. Let's hear them. So from a, for primary teeth, for example, one of the still a, discussions we're having are the need, for example, for CT or imaging. So for primary with, teeth. Correct. For, because there is a part of the guidelines that is for primary teeth, and then there are right. another part that is for permanent teeth. Right. So for primary t- trauma in primary teeth, you know, the whole concept of the gentle, you know, co- campaign, which basically is as minimal as possible uh, imaging and dosimetry to children, okay. is basically one of their main things right. we're taking in consideration. So with the new digital... A technology we have lower the symmetry. The radiologists, yeah, radiologists, have this thing. correct. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, but still, we wanted to. Right now, for example, you know, we had in the previous guidelines to take occlusal uh, images. We don't do occlusals anymore. It's just a lot yeah. of radiation and no a lot of information. So we're basically mostly uh, right now changing in few cases where it's necessary. We do recommend more CT if available because again, these are worldwide. Guidelines for the entire world, so we need to make so, also I'm something sorry, that's affordable. So give me a circumstance, just so I can put in context of practice for a pediatric dentist. Uh, you said primary teeth. You're recommending maybe some more image. Uh, for example, CT. the typical. When, the typical when would, case, would I do that? An intrusion, for example. There are okay. some intrusion cases in which you don't even see the tooth. You don't okay. even know sometimes if the tooth has been evolved or is intruded. Okay. And and in those cases, for example, if it's intruded, the impact or the position of that intrusion. A, in relation to, to the permanent, to the permanent tooth. tooth, is critical. Okay. So you can get that on a, on a PA or on a two-dimensional. The there you go. So that's going to be, for example, a change. Intrusion, even in primary teeth, we're going to recommend CTs from now on. So what do I? So they're going to recommend CTs. We so will, if I'm a, we most recommend dentists, I think, don't have a CT in their practice. Correct. So what do we do? So basically, it's going to say the guidelines, in order to cover everyone, not put anyone under the standard of care, it's going to say basically, if available, a CT CT should be. Consider Very, for that's a big change. Big changes. So big this changes. Is that is kind of the this? main. This is the first time I'm saying that's this. a big deal. I probably that's a big deal. <laughs> yes. So, so that's going to be primary teeth. That's basically most you know kind of the big change. In permanent teeth, there are many more changes as well. What are, can you just share one or two of those, maybe one um, of those? Well, let's say in vital pulp therapy, meaning in traumatic injuries in which there is an exposure of the pulp. Uh, most of the therapies right now are going to be recommending using MTA, bioceramics, or biodentin versus calcium rocks that it was in the past. Okay. So for partial pulpotomies, direct pulp capping, cervical pulpotomies, all of it will be with more contemporary biomaterials rather than, you know, a old or, you know, still pr- relevant, but perhaps not as good as the new ones. So that, that's a big deal when I think about... In, in, in your expertise of vital pulp therapy, and I was going to ask this later, but I'm going to go ahead and put it in right Jump now since you, since you mentioned that. Most pediatric dentists, most practices, and I bet you if we surveyed people at this meeting, they have calcium hydroxide in their office. They have zinc oxide eugenol in their office. Should I throw those away? Pretty much. Both Pretty of them. Much. Just get rid of them. Pretty much. So, yes. you know, we, a lot of, especially people who have been practicing for a while, we learned on those products. That's true. And, you know, you become emotionally attached to the idea that this is the way it works, and if I don't do this, I'm doing the wrong thing. So you're telling me today I should use MTA. That's true. For MTA, all the circumstances MTA, why I use those, or, use MTA, MTA or MTA compounds, meaning compounds, yes. there are a lot of similar products to MTA based on the same composition with minor differences. Uh, most of them right now I would separate in three different categories. MTA, the original composition, bioceramics, and biodentin. Okay. So basically biodentin is the only one. It's a little bit different, more based on silicates, but... Um, but right now, all of the three, especially MTA and bioceramics, because there's not a lot of research still on biodentin, although it's very popular because they are yeah. marketing very strongly, but right. there's not a lot of research about it. So a lot of the products we're using more is MTA, and we have plenty of MTA now companies I saw this right meeting, now. There are five, six, there is, I mean, finally, it's emerging. Now, finally. And the price went down, right? Right. In 2015, that happened because actually a company that bought the original uh, rights, actually, they has exclusivity. And the root that, DX, you mean? No, it was a a root, pro root, which pro was Densply. Densply had the exclusivity, and that was very expensive. And yeah. then when they lost, 
but if you see it in 2015, basically the price has dropped because right now you have many companies. So competing. I think, Dr. Kohenka, I'm going to call you Nestor today. That's perfect. <laughs> Thank Nestor, you. Nestor, we need, we need a stronger message, I think, because I think I it's agree. really powerful, and I'm thrilled that the IEDT is going to come out with guidelines that say, let's start using MTA once and for all because we're all teaching this in our programs, and I think we need a message that says, no, use MTA. That's true. Strong, because it's kind of been, I, I, I don't know if you agree, I think the message... The science sounds like it's been clear. It's and that's very why clear. you're changing it's the guidelines. The message hasn't been clear. No. The message correct. needs to be get correct. rid of that, do this. Correct. And it should be endorsed by the big you know, organizations in the world, including the IDT, the AEA, right. PD within the US and everywhere else. But yes, that's the, that's the idea. And we will support every change in the guidelines with very strong scientific evidence. I would suggest, and maybe, maybe I'm being out of line, but as a result of that meeting in August in San Diego, Maybe a memo gets sent to all the program directors of the pediatric dentistry programs and says, I will be more than happy under these think. situations, we recommend strongly that you, based on these guidelines that were developed based on science, that you no longer use calcium hydroxide or zinc oxide eugenol, that, is that you use MTA. That is correct for trauma, and that will be easy because there is going to be a, hopefully, a, not only a guideline by the IDT, but those guidelines are going to be endorsed by the APD. So it's going to be very natural for the program directors to start basically using and following those guidelines. But it also extends to pineapple therapy from, right. from carious exposure and other. I mean, so the pulp is still the same. The reasons for the exposure might be different. But still, from a material perspective, it's still a, we're still talking about the same materials, which are extremely biocompatible. But the main key of the success of this material is the sealing ability and sealing. prevention of my sealing. Is Those the whole three thing. materials you mentioned before are all sealers. It's all about seal. It's, it's all about to do seal. With, it's not about what we used to say. We're regenerating pulp or any of that business. If they do, that's going to be a nice plus, thing. But a nice thing to have, but definitely not needed. But it's what the you sealing. Really need, the seal is the deal. The seal is the deal. The seal. That's your button Just, right there. The seal is the deal. Right. Okay. You'd have we to prevent bacterial leakage. That's the whole so, deal. <laughs> the pulp can recover from everything else pretty much besides microbacterial leakage. I love this. I'm excited to see that release, and I really strongly recommend a very powerful, not even a recommendation, but like this is what you should be doing. That is true. And I, I'll, I'll, I'll work with you on that if, we, if I can help. So any other emerging things coming out of these trauma guidelines? Yes. Um, um, so that regarding crown fractures and pulp exposures and pulp therapy, regarding a lot of changes actually in the field of luxation and avulsions. Hmm. A lot of changes. Such as? One of them, for example, we already dropped in 2013 one of the recommendations, which was to soak the teeth in fluoride, for example. That's, Where did that come from? Well, it comes from a paper in 1973 from a group in, in UPenn, actually stating that soaking sodium fluoride will prevent resorption, which is completely un, unbased. There's just okay. one research. It was kind of there, and I, you so know, and I we, took we, it out in 2013. You're saying we all did this based on that one well, paper? Uh, we were recommending. I don't think many people did it in real life, but it wasn't the recommendation. So we, I actually took it off. I mean, I, I suggested taking it off, and thankfully they agree with that. So we're cleaning now, up things a little so bit. So right now we're not using, we're not recommending sodium fluoride. We need to also short you know, the steps that are completely unnecessary and focus on the ones that are critical. So another thing is, <clears throat> for example, new research in 2015 was published about soaking the teeth in doxycycline, per, yeah. especially immature teeth that were evolved. We were supposed to soak them in doxycycline for five to 20 minutes before reimplantation. All those studies were done in animals and animal studies in dogs and, and monkeys at the time. No human study was done. So in 2015, there was a retrospective study published in Sweden, which actually evaluated more than 500 cases, and they saw that there's no difference in the revascularization potential or the outcome of the reimplantation, whether or not you're soaking doxycycline. So that's dropped. So that's going to drop. That's going to drop. Wow. So these, that's, this that's is, dropping this, also. This is late-breaking news here. This is good stuff. And more. I mean, we will drop, for example, recommendations. I mean, normally general recommendation in all you know, luxations, from subluxation, luxation, avulsions, we always recommend that soft tissue diet. That's going to drop also. There is no logic in the world to recommend soft, soft diet, actually. Sorry, as I said, soft, wow. tissue, soft diet. So basically that goes There's so exactly many recommendations <laughs> in dentistry that are based on the way we've always done it. Yes, and it's and now it, we're making it reality. You have to think out of the box, basically, in order to understand it. I can That's share more about that. A, a lot of big deals. And the other one that is going to be a big deal is going to be, hopefully, and we're not sure because that is the only topic that is still not, it's controversial. And half of the committee, uh, you know, approve or promote or support one idea. The other one, the other one is that the threshold of extra dry time, which has been set for 60 minutes forever, 
has basically no support in the research, in the literature. All the research available, which is not many, but there are like five or six research papers well done, are actually pointing at the threshold of dry time of volsteves to be within 20 to 30 minutes. So basically after 20, 30 minutes in dry time, I mean, there's no change for the PDLs to recover. So we're basically giving anywhere that is between 30 and 60 minutes, we're giving a false expectation to the parents and hoping that something will happen in the periodontion will re- so are you saying that the, won't happen. Are you saying that the new guidelines are going to say that if that tooth's in the, out of the mouth for a half an hour, don't bother? No, I won't say that. No, never. You still need to reimplant. Okay. But it's going to be a different, a different protocol for reimplantation. Okay. It's like right now, if you look at the, re, at the re protocol for 60 minutes in dry, or more than 60 minutes in dry, the protocol is different. So there are basically three different categories in the ball's teeth. One is if the tooth has been reimplanted right away at site of injury, which is always the best. Yeah. The second one would be if the tooth has been reimplanted within 60 minutes in dry, and that's, again, the threshold which we're hoping to drop to 30. And okay. Or the tooth has been in a biological storage medium for a few hours, but still the cells have been preserved. And the third was kind of the worst case scenario in which teeth has been in dry for 60 minutes, which right now we're going to drop, to, drop 30. to 30. So, that's so a big still change. we're reimplanted because these are, you okay, know... Okay, so you're basically changing children. the 60 to 30. Correct, but we're giving a much realistic expectation to the parents. We're already start planning in those cases what's going to be eventually completely necessary, which is the decoronation of those teeth eventually. So we still think there is a benefit of reimplanting those teeth in seven, eight-year-old children okay. until they start basically creating harm, which will be when they start their growth spurt. And that's so, when we normally recommend the second step. I'm going to sidebar into decoronation because you mentioned it here. Can you, can you tell me a little bit about that? And what, so what, so first of all, tell me what it is. I, I, we all kind of know, but tell us from so your... So decoronation yeah. basically is a procedure that, again, was, was first recommended in the 80s. And the idea is that when you have, it's indicated for teeth with replacement resorption or ankylosis in growing, I mean, children's and growing adolescents. So basically the idea is what are the options when you have an ankylosed tooth? So do nothing. Well, basically, you know, the tooth will remain anchored to the same position it was reimplanted, while it will actually prevent the premaxilla from growing. So the whole facial growth of that patient will be jeopardized. So the other options were, well, extracted, but to extract an ankylos tooth, you basically remove a whole, the whole cortical plate. And the dust, and you do, dusty, and, it's and all you dust never, coming and out. You never, and you never recover that. So right, those, right. those cases were 100% of them needed a, a major, probably two to three step grafting procedures before those, those teeth would you know, be able to get an implant or a permanent rehabilitation. So decoronation basically comes to stop that and provides basically a better alternative by saying, okay, so if the root is anyway being replaced by bone. That's the process of replacement, right? Yeah, no, that's going to happen. Yeah. No, it's going to happen. It's happening. And the yeah. only two things that are going to in some way irritate or stop that procedure are the root canal filling, which is going to act as a foreign body reaction when right. the osteoblast reaches, and the crown, because bone, of course, cannot, the ridge cannot bow, you know, grow coronal or buckle to the crown. So by removing the person decoration, that's the whole principle. Is you remove the crown, you decoronate, you leave the root structure, then you remove the root canal filling material and fill it with just the blood of the patient. Basically like an extraction. You don't want to leave a dry socket. It's kind of guided regeneration. Yeah, in a way. And then, and then you close. And what happens is that yeah. right now without the crown, without the root canal filling, the root will basically be continued to resorb and replaced by bone. Eventually, after two years, you won't even see that the root is still there. It's going right. to be completely gone. It's facilitated bone preservation. But at the same, not only preservation, if you do it at the right timing, which is immediately at the initiation of growth spurred and it's deferred, you know, every patient is different, but mostly there is a big difference between genders. In girls, you need to start earlier than boys and you have a shorter f- window of time. Basically, you can actually gain, not only preserve, you can gain coronal and buccal bone, coronal to those root structures that you're wow, living. That's fantastic. Now, should, as so a pediatric it's, dentist, it's, should I be doing that? Up, well, you could. I've been teaching your residents to do it. <laughs> so your residents are doing it. We should, we should, should, yeah, we should, did a lot of decorations in, okay. in the pediatric practice in University of Washington. I mean, I've done with... Or we could refer to an endodontist who could do it. Quite honestly, I yes, but unfortunately not many endodontists are doing that either. Okay, well, that's a good one to know. I want to pause it's, for a second and say sure. we're, we're here at the AAPD meeting at the annual session in Honolulu, Hawaii, in the exhibit hall at the Tech Bar. And we're recording our podcast. At the end of this podcast, in about 10 minutes or less, I'm going to invite any people here in the audience to ask a question. Uh, don't have to be questions, but if you have some, you have the chance to ask the expert on this subject. Uh, we'll get your questions later. So I'm going to come back to you, Nestor, 
And I'm gonna. There's so many things I'd love to talk about. Oh, we have please. limited time. I have to have please. you back on the show if you come back please. another time. Please. We can do it up in Seattle or on the phone or whatever you want. I saw you have a new app, mm -hmm. a trauma, a dental trauma app. You can That's download correct. it. I have it on my phone. Yes. And you have i. You can get it on an iPhone or the preferred Android. phone, the Samsung. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> uh, anyway, you can get it on your phone. So tell me about this app. I so love this, it, by the way. This app actually, the concept of creating an app started about a few years ago, but we understood there was an app actually previously, but okay. it was a paid app. And, oh. and that app never really took off, ne never was successful because people need to pay. And if you pay even a few bucks, it's still going to detriment people from doing. I mean, you everything is free. You say, I'll get to try. If I don't like it, I'll delete it. Right. But, uh, and second of all, uh, it was not strategically designed to be like a snowball effect, which yeah, is yeah. what it needs to be. So we at the ADT changed that, recognized that problem and said, we need to create an app that is going to be free and is going to be, you know, mostly for non-dental and non-healthcare providers, but mostly parents. for parents, teachers, coaches, paramedics, nurses, yeah. where accidents really happen and have them have this in their app so they can use it and get immediate I like help. the paramedic thing. Yeah, everything. I mean, we have a lot of research. Even physicians in the ER, quite honestly, yeah, need that. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so we developed, and the idea was, again, there is the main part is actually for patients, for parents, and there are two components. One is what to do in case something happened, and then you get inside and you see the different type of injuries. So you cannot, yeah. and it's all in lay terms. So instead of avulsion, we use the, the word knockout tooth. Instead of fracture, complicated crown fracture, we use broken teeth. So everything, and then you see the image, and you can see your child or whatever is injured in front and recognize what type of injury is that, and then you click there, and you will get a That's one, a great two, three service. steps. Moreover, in the near future, we're going to add geolocation, which basically you can oh, wow. find an emergency care or a dentist near me, and you can be anywhere in the world, and basically wow. you will be able to search and find anyone that is close by where you can go and seek help. And you can get it, and Amazon will deliver a new tooth in two hours. No, <laughs> no, 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 not yet. <laughs> okay. need, we need the real tooth in right away, but... But that's the concept. There is another component, which is for professional, but that's yeah. completely secondary. And the second strategy is to make it viral, to make it like, so basically the job is to everyone here to download. And more important than download is to start referring that. And you can refer that by email, text message, Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, I love it. I anything. Think, I love this. I think, you know, so you have the new guidelines. You told some exciting things are happening. You have a new app. I hope that gets promoted broadly. I think everybody well, here. We got. Talk, we should. We should tell every one of our patients, Absolutely. families in the office Absolutely. to get this app on their phone. Absolutely. As part of every visit, we should tell our schools. We should. We, we can be everywhere. We can be the messengers. Absolutely. Us, so we, will, we, we will. We will do that. We will do that for you. And so, just to make a number, the previous apps, you know, got three thousand downloads over a period of ten years. Yeah. We released it four weeks ago. We have around twelve thousand in less than oh, a month. We're going to get another five thousand for you today. Watch <laughs> that this. That would be great. Okay. Thank you. So tell me a little bit, what else is the IADT doing besides the app and the new guidelines? What are some of the other projects of the uh, we, Traumatology Association? We're doing, uh, encouraging more research in some fields. Yes. For example, like I was talking before, I mean, probably not in the 2018 guidelines, but in the future guidelines, you will see more and more actually protocols or recommendations leading toward immediate physiological movement or function of the teeth rather than putting them on splint or, or for, for weeks Right now, you will start seeing more active spleen, meaning a spleens that are actually doing, in a way, you have to relate this to orthopedic and neurosurgery, mm -hmm. physical therapy after an injury. We know that from those fields of medicine, there's no, there are no more casts. Right now, we're having boots. There's no right. more putting boots, a patient after a, after a knee replacement or a hip replacement. They don't spend more than a couple of hours in bed after the surgery Move before it. they get, start. Get going. Yeah, correct. get going. So yeah. that is completely a concept that we never did it. So even if you put a flexible spleen, the child or the patient will never actually take a bite with those teeth because it hurts. So we need to actually to start right now changing the philosophy and say, well, actually, we don't need a spleen. We need actually an active movement. Function. You need function. To encourage more healing than rather than atrophy. Right. And that's what we're right now doing a lot of research well, on. along and, with the rest of the body. And the probably in the few the years we're going to have more. Uh, right now we completed already a few animal studies with amazing results. I can tell you that already. And right now you, we're moving you've, you've into... You've done a lot of animal studies yourself. I know yes, you've, that is correct. And this go, is one of the ones that I did. You've done a lot of those studies. Yes, yeah. yes. And we basically put braces actually immediately yeah. after implantation. Yeah. And the results were impressive. I mean, they didn't develop replacement resorption comparing to the passive spleen, which, which they did. 
So we need to do more you know, right I, now, I, human I think, studies. I but think that's where the, we're leading on. I would say that in the area of vital pulp therapy and traumatology, the areas that we're talking about today, there's probably been more change in people who are in mid-career or late career in pediatric dentistry relative to what they learned oh. in their training than any other area of dentistry. Well, in dentistry, well, everything well, I, mean, I, was training the, I was trained in the 90s, and I don't do what I did in the 90s. I don't do what, right now what I did in the 2000s. Right, right. I mean, I, it's an evolving field, and you have to evolve with it. If not, there's no so option. I, I want to ask just a couple more things in the remaining minute or two we have Please. here. Revascularization. Yeah. Uh, another term and technique gets thrown around and right. maybe just let's just not forget to talk about that and what is it and who should be doing it and uh, when everyone should be at least knowing about it i'm not saying doing about okay. it but be knowledgeable about that option is done in immature a uh, young permanent teeth with a necrotic pulp okay. if the pulp is vital you will always go you with the, pulp you will preserve the pulp MTA, you will not, et cetera. correct yeah. i mean there, you keep what is there so but if the pulp, pulp is already completely a dead pulp and a young permanent and a tooth necrotic pulp will be the right term okay, with, with apical periodontitis an infection okay. and a very immature tooth then basically you have only two options apexification which was the old fashioned way or try to basically bring new cells into that space after you disinfect so the whole principle is get inside, disinfect that space, and then try to bring cells into that space in order for those well, cells to It's kind of like grow. decoronization in the sense that you want to bring blood in there, but for different right, purposes. Right, for different purposes. Here, yeah. you are trying to basically, you know, regrowth a dentinal, the pulpal dentinal complex with ovontoblast, which is where we're not there yet. So we get revascularization, but we definitely do not get regeneration, which would be the same, like, growing pulp, basically. We're not so, growing so pulp. So apexification is still in order? It's still in order in case in which the root is in mature enough that you can still do something more predictable because revascularization is still, in a way, a little bit unpredictable. There are just too many techniques, too many ideas, too many concepts evolving all the time. Yes. But I think that still, in some cases, is the way to go when the root is extremely short and immature. And yet again, we need to know I th I what, what we try to achieve. What you said in the beginning is most important, that we need to know about it. Exactly. We, we all just need to understand. Need to know and about as the that, science those evolves. Teeth, and those teeth do not need to be extracted. We have several options. We have options. And we need to, again, be realistic to our expectation. Are we going to get like more a new pulp? Probably not. Not right. anytime soon, at least. Right. Until we start those. But you got to start somewhere. Stemma. But we get repair. And, yeah. We get repair, which is more like a bone-like tissue, cemental-like right. tissue growth, which is for any functional purpose is equally great. So it's a moving up. Apexification, if I'm doing that, still calcium my drop No side. way, no, no. How no, am I no. doing that then, MTA? No, MTA only. So right. tell me quickly, 30 seconds, how do I do an apexification? You just disinfect the canal, that's the key again, and yeah. then you seal the apex. Wait, with with, uh, with sodium anything you, With sodium hypochlorite, but it's not about the irrigant and the solution, okay. it's not about the, chem, the Sorry, chemistry. Sorry, I took some of your 30 it's seconds, about, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and then basically you go ahead and yeah. seal that apex. And if there is enough length, you don't need to go through any reverse so position. I pack it all seal. the way down from the top down to the apex? Just three to four millimeters, and then you fill the rest of the canal with anything you want, or you can reinforce that with a fiber post. It's in like order doing to an apical root canal with MTA. with MTA. That is correct. And that's, that's why the way to go. And that eliminates. I, that's why I need an endodontist. <laughs> and that eliminates 18 months of replacement of customer oxide, which was the typical right, way of doing it. You're done. I'm done. Yeah, you're I'm done. done in 60 minutes. I mean, minutes. not done here, but you're done with the procedure, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done with the procedure. That I got is it. correct. That's great. And you can restore the same day. That's great. Well, uh, I want to thank you, Dr. Kohanka, for thank being you. with us today thank on Keto Teeth Talk. Again. We're here live, and we do have the chance to take a question or two. If I see any questions, we'll take them. If not, I want to thank our audience. I want to thank all of you who are listening to this recorded. From behalf of the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, you just listened to Pedo Teeth Talk. Up-to-date information. And today we have the chance to talk to our expert, Dr. <laughs> Nestor Kohanka. Thank you very much. Adonis from Seattle, Washington. Thank, Thank you, very, you much. very much. Thanks for having Take me. Take care. Thank you. Pedo Teeth Talk is brought to you by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, the show that delivers cutting-edge ideas for the professional specializing in pediatric dentistry. If you have any questions or comments, please email info at aapd.org. We welcome your ideas for future shows and guests. For more information on the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, visit aapd.org.